Today we're going to be looking at the buffer region of a titration curve. We've been looking at the points along the curve uh, as you titrate, so what, it, what the pH would be before the titration even begins, uh, when you're at the equivalence point, after the equivalence point, but the hardest part of a titration curve is when you're in that buffer zone, that highlighted part that you see there. Uh, if someone were to ask you for a definition of what a buffer is, it's a solution that resists a change in pH when a strong acid or base is added. You can see how the pH part of the curve there, um, it holds pretty steady during that highlighted section. It changes a little bit, but it's, it's hovering somewhere around the 4-ish range that whole time. Finding the pH during this part is tricky because you have a, multiple substances to keep track of. So you can see right underneath the graph there, there's the reaction that's taking place, a weak acid, HA, plus OH minus, forming A minus and water. What makes finding the pH at this part of the graph so tricky is that you have multiple substances to keep track of. You have leftover HA, leftover weak acid because it's an excess at that part on the graph, but you also have some of that A minus that has formed. The amount of A minus that has been formed will be dependent upon the limiting reactant there. In this case, the hydroxide ion would be your limiting reactant because you haven't yet hit your equivalence point. Um, so you have some HA, you have some A minus, and because they're both in there, uh, it, the reaction gets a little bit trickier to try and figure out what the pH would be. If you have enough information there, you could find the molarities of the HA and the A minus, set up an ice table, use the Ka value of that HA reacting with water, and that will allow you to find the H3O plus concentration and therefore the pH. There are two requirements to make a buffer. Your buffer needs to contain an acid and a base. The acid's job is to react with any possible hydroxide ions that might be added. The base's job is to react with any possible hydronium ions. One of the catches is, is that the acid and the base cannot react with one another. So what that means is, is that usually a buffer is prepared from a conjugate acid-base pair. They don't react with one another. So during that highlighted section of the graph, we have HA, a weak acid and A minus, its conjugate base. So the weak acid HA could react with any hydroxide ions that we put in there, like what's happening during our titration there, right? That's a weak acid strong base titration going on. So when the hydroxide's added, the HA part of that buffer uh, can react with any hydroxide ions that are added and that it, then the pH holds relatively steady for quite a while because of that reaction going on between the HA and the OH minus. Uh, the conjugate base, A minus, could react with any H3O plus that we put in there. The HA and the A minus don't react with one another. So we've met both requirements. We have a buffer. And I didn't mean to do this, but then after I found this picture, I thought it was perfect. The aha moment of what a buffer is and what the buffer region really means. Um, and it has A and HA in aha. I thought that was pretty good. Why do we have buffers? Where are they used? Where might we need them? Uh, in your body, your there's a whole bunch of biochemical processes that happen inside your body that only work under a very narrow pH range. Your blood, for example, has a carbonate bicarbonate ion buffer that keeps the pH of your blood close to 7.4. And you can see off to the side there, if it deviates um, even a little bit, if your pH goes below 7.35, you suffer from a condition called acidosis. If it goes above 7.45, alkalosis. And then if you go above 7.8 or below 7, it's not looking good for you. Uh, in shampoos, many shampoos, if you read the ingredient label, a lot of them have citric acid in them or sodium citrate. 
they use the combination of the weak acid and its conjugate base as a buffer to keep your uh, pH of your shampoo just a little bit on the acidity si acidic side, and it counteracts the basicity of the detergent that's in the shampoo to keep your hair clean. Uh, baby lotion tend to have pHs around 6, and that's to prevent any bacterial growth uh, that might happen in diapers, diaper rash, that kind of a thing. If you wanted to make a buffer, you have to mix, you have to have an acid, you have to ba have a base, and they can't react with one another. So we could make a buffer if we combine some acetic acid and some sodium acetate. It gives us some volumes, some molarities there, and it wants to know what the pH of the buffer would be. The first thing you need to remember whenever you're mixing chemicals together is that the molarities of those chemicals are going to change as you mix them. The solutions dilute one another. So that acetic acid starts with a molarity of 1.4, starts with a volume of 0.5, after we mix it with that half liter of the sodium acetate, its new volume is now one liter. So the molarity gets cut in half because we're doubling the volume. So molarity of that acetic acid is now 0.7. Same thing happens to the acetate. It starts with a molarity of 1.2, half a liter. When we mix it with the acetic acid, its new volume is one liter. So its new molarity cut in half, 0.6. If you wanted to know what that pH of that buffer is that you just made, uh, and you knew what the Ka value for acetic acid is, you could use the Ka equation, the dissociation of acetic acid and water, and set up an ice table. You know what the molarities of the acetic acid and the acetate ions are. You, since you know what Ka is, you can have the acetic acid come down by some amount x, the acetate ion and the hydronium ion come up by some amount x. You would get to ignore that x value for the acetic acid and the acetate ions because even if you take the Ka value and multiply it by 100, it's still much, much smaller than that 0.7 or 0.6. So sig fig wise, it's significantly, it's insignificant. Uh, but it does make a difference for that hydronium ion since that started at zero, whatever X is, it's going to have some kind of impact there. After we set up our Ka products over reactants, we do the acetate times the hydronium over the acetic acid. Then we could solve for X, which is our hydronium ion concentration. And then we could take the negative log of that number in order to find the pH of our buffer.